This conference will now be recorded. So, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wills Estates and Probate Records. My name is Charity Rouse. I am the Director of Local History for the Spartanburg County Public Library System in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, we have a group of folks from a lot of different places tonight, so I'm excited to share this with you. Uh, the examples I will be sharing will be mostly from um, Spartanburg County or South Carolina, a couple from Virginia, um, and there are other states that have very similar setups, so um, hopefully this will all be helpful to you. This presentation is being recorded and it will be placed on the library's YouTube channel in our genealogy playlist, and uh, we would love for you to follow us there. So let's jump in. So, the really basic question, what is a will? Well, a will is the official testament of someone as to what they want done with their land, money, and other belongings. It is a legally binding document if witnessed and registered correctly. Um, otherwise, it can be contested and um, it can be very interesting, the controversies that come up um, as people are um, dealing with the dispersal of someone's belongings. Um, so, and then what is probate? Well, probate is the official process of dealing with the estate of a deceased person through the courts. Um, if there is no resolution um, in probate court, or if there's something that is contested in probate, the case can be moved to another court. Um, South Carolina has equity courts, and then Virginia uses chancery courts. Um, and those are by and large the same type of, of cases go to those courts. Um, and that is for partition when you have, for instance, the heirs from wife number one are all over 21 and want their property and the youngest child of wife number three or four happens to be, you know, two or three. Um, and so you may have, um, some of the heirs saying, look, I don't wanna wait until this two-year-old is 21 before I can get my property from dad's estate. And so it goes into equity court or chancery court. Other states do have different names for this. Um, I, Pennsylvania, I think is guardian guardian court maybe, um, or orphans court, orphan, I, I've seen both. So just know in South Carolina, you're looking for equity court. Um, and then, you know, there may be other reasons why probate can take years. Um, sometimes um, probate is held up due to the widow not remarrying and ending up living for 40 years. And so sometimes it does take time to settle the estate. Um, so does every person have a will and or probate file? Short answer, no. Um, it can depend on the laws of the time period. It can also depend on the location. Some things, um, sometimes if someone doesn't have significant property, they don't have to um, do probate. Um, it's because that's usually dealing with real and personal property. Um, most, many men, if they had property, if they had children, then it is more likely that they will have um, a will and or a probate file. Um, if you're female, are you single, lifetime single, or are you widowed, you may have um, some property that you have charge of. Um, if there are significant debts to others, um, that will often cause probate because the debtors really want their money back. And if the death was expected or unexpected can make a difference as to whether, a, whether there is a will or if there is not a will. Um, and then one of the things we have to deal with in genealogy is that all of the documents did not, alas, survive. So sometimes 
we have documents and sometimes stuff either walked out of the courthouse along the way with a previous researcher or um you know there was fire flood active war different things did happen and um tornadoes somebody's from out in kansas tonight um so you may have um loss of documents so some definitions as we get started um a testament so last will and testament you will um see that it's just it's another term for will um the testator male or testatrix female is the one who makes a will these are from the latin um if you died testate it means you died with a legally valid will. If you died intestate, you died without a will. And so the same functions happen with those two um, states, but the names of who are doing the actions change. So if you died uh, intestate, you have an administrator or administratrix um, who is the person or persons appointed by the court to administrate a will where there is no executor named. So if you die intestate or if you don't name a, an executor in your will, then you will have an administrator or administratrix. Or if the person that you named as executor chooses not to um, be the executor. And then an executor or executrix is the person named by the testator or testatrix and approved by the court to carry out the instructions in the will. Um, and I have seen where um, some of the um, executors, um, executors who are named decline the opportunity to be the executor. So, um, you know, just because you name the person doesn't mean that person's going to be, but there's going to be some paperwork in the files that says, I decline to do this, um, or this person declined, so this person is being proposed by the family or um, by those in the, in the charge of the, the program. Um, so some things to consider, um, time frame and location these things do vary so um take a little bit of time to look up what practices and laws might be in that time period in that state um and even within a state sometimes things differ um between different eras uh your local public librarian is always um happy to give you the chance to um, ask questions and tell you more about that local area. And I have just reposted the handout link. Thank you for the question. And um, that is in the chat bubble. So if you are doing this live, um, please feel free to grab that handout and feel free to put any questions in the chat um, and I will catch them as I can. Um, this is being recorded, so if you don't want your video on, you might want to turn it off. Um, I don't know if anybody has it on now, so um, other than me. Thank you for being here. Um, so you may find ancestors, um, people that you're looking for, um, not just as the person whose will is being uh, looked at, probated. You may find them as a witness, a court official, a guardian, a beneficiary, um, someone getting items from the will, purchaser of items being sold at the uh, estate sale um, or auction. Um, so you may find lots of information in this. You may also find an earlier version of a will, which is not the official testament validated in probate. Um, had an interesting situation. Um, young man came into the room and he had a will of an ancestor who was going off to fight in the Civil War in the 1860s and wrote a will. That will had been passed down in the family, but that the person who wrote the will didn't die in the war. He didn't die until the 1890s. 
And so we were able to find the will that was actually probated. But that earlier will does give a good picture as to what the person was thinking, the young soldier was thinking as he went off to war and what property he owned at that time. Um, there, there were some enslaved people mentioned and what needed to happen with them and that kind of thing that of course did not happen in the 1890s, um, early 1890s when this gentleman died that because emancipation had happened. And so you may find earlier versions of wills or multiple versions of wills depending on um, life circumstances of the person. Um, the will is most often filed in the county where the person died. Occasionally you will also see it filed in multiple counties if they owned, um, owned property in multiple counties. Um, sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. Deeds are the same way. Usually they are um, filed in the locale that the property is. Um, so again, a will is filed where you died typically or where you usually resided. If you died while on vacation, it's probably going to be filed where you actually live. So you may have to look in a couple of places. Um, the age of children um, does make a difference. A lot of people do write a will when they have children who might need a guardian and they are wanting to be very specific as to which, uh, which people are the alternative guardians in the case that they can't raise their children. So sometimes you don't get that, sometimes you do. So how do you find wills, estates, and probates? Um, the courthouse, uh, clerk of court is one of your best options. However, <laughs> some of them do have online access, but many do not have online access. Spartanburg County doesn't take out of area requests, and they don't take email requests or phone requests. You literally have to show up, check in hand to request the, the documents at the courthouse, at the clerk's office. And right now, things are a little closed down. So um, it doesn't hurt to check their website, but also know that if it is an older will or document, um, it may not be at the courthouse, it may have been moved to a state or regional archive, um, and older items may have been microfilmed. So you may go, want to go to the nearest public library or the nearest larger public library that has a genealogy center, check to see if they have access on microfilm or otherwise to the information about what wills and probate are available for their county or their area. So you may also find printed abstracts or transcriptions. Um, we do have books of those for the early um, probate cases and deeds in our, in our room for Spartanburg County, and those exist for many places. One of the best resources right now is familysearch.org, and these are image files from microfilm. They went through starting in the 1930s and filmed many, 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 many uh, two and a half million rolls worth of microfilm uh, of lots of records, including court records, including probate, wills, estates. And um, these are available through a uh, search in the catalog on Family Search. Don't just search by name from the front page, um, but do an image search um, in the, or do a search in the catalog for court records, for probate, for wills, um, it's under a couple different headings, but do, do search location first and then what records are there. They are aggregating a bunch of these things into larger collections, which sometimes makes it hard to cite, but we'll look at some of that in just a minute. As I referenced a minute ago, state or regional archives and libraries may have scanned some of these items from their collections and just know that this is a multi-step process no matter where you find the records unless you luck into somebody has name indexed that particular record set for that particular location and time period you're gonna have to do a little digging so we're gonna talk about how to do the digging 
And I'm just posting another link to the handout. Okay. So when I refer to microfilm, I have been reminded by some work with the Boy Scouts recently that I need to show what microfilm is for some people who grew up after the film strip kind of world. Um, and in the, the age of digital everything. So microfilm is being digitized. It's still around. Family Search um, had two and a half million rolls of microfilm, give or take a couple hundred thousand. And they have most many of them have been scanned they're i think close to two million or a little over two million of the roles have been scanned and put online at familysearch.org but they have not been indexed into their online name search index you will have to treat the digital images just like you would treat the role of microfilm um, the microfilm that is um, shown here happens to be a newspaper role because it's what i had at home um as an example it's a duplicate i yeah we have we have other roles of this film it's okay um but uh it's it's literally pictures of the document that are stored on this roll of of 35 millimeter or there's some narrower ones that 16 millimeter film or some flat fish microfish um and so it's it's a compact way of storing the um information on the microfilm of our probate records that we have for Spartanburg County in uh, the Kennedy Room, they have indexes to the books. These are the microfilm of the same index that you would look in if you went to the clerk of court's office and were looking at it. One of the things I would encourage you to do is read through some of the little document, the documentation at the beginning of a roll of film because it tells the clerks how they're supposed to use these indexes. There are a number of different indexing companies that sold these court indexes. This happens to be Arl Bryan. It's a South Carolina outfit, but I have found place to place these indexes are pretty similar. Um, and so they'll have the same types of information. You have the sub index, which tells you phonetically what groupings of names, and then the main index, which tells you where that particular family name appears. And we have examples. So on the sub index for names, you will see that they group AA, AB, AC, AD. And you read through this, and you've got Abercrombie, Abernathy, Acre, Acker. Um, down here, you've got Adkins and you have Atkins. So they cross reference that with the ATs as well. And so I'm going to show you an Adkins Atkins because it demonstrates that sometimes you have to go phonetically and you occasionally have to get creative. But on this, it tells you to go to page 17. These are all odd number pages. And so there are no even numbers. So just recognize that when you're scrolling through the, the pictures. And um, so I went to page 17. It is page 17A. Um, you will find 17A, B, C, D, however many letters they need to get all of the, the people indexed in that surname. And um, you get Atkins, A-D, and you also get Atkins, A-T you get uh, a breakdown of the person who the court case is focused on. So whether it's uh, a decedent, someone who died, a minor or a ward, so those would be minor children, or a ward could be um, an adult who needed someone to administer their um, affairs because they were not capable of doing it, um, earlier periods because they were a woman and the women should not trouble their their brains about financial stuff um etc and then you get the name of the administrator or um guardian or uh executor and um so you get that name and you get who what role they're they're participating in and then you get a file number this one happens to be 336, 
and the date that it was filed was August 10th, 1863. You get these later ones going up to 8768, November of November 6, 1928. And you may find that indexes cover more years than the probate files have been filmed. In Spartanburg County, our, our probate index goes all the way well into the 20th century, and our files only go 1785 through 1900. So they have not microfilmed the rest of them, um, which we're starting to agitate for at least maybe a straight to digitization, but we're working on it. Um, so, and what this tells us is where to look in the files. So I went to our microfilm of the files, which are just for probate, it's files one through whatever it was in 1900. And this is case number 336. One of the good things that they did when they microfilmed these and most of the other probate kinds of um, estates that I've seen across different states and areas is they start with a file number screen and they end with an end of the estate. So as you're scrolling down on Family Search or as you're scrolling forward on the microfilm, you can kind of figure out where a case will begin or end, because these cases can be as short as one page or as long as hundreds of pages. Um, I was working on one where a guy had a half interest in a hotel. So they inventoried every hotel room and counted his half interest in every soap holder and towel and sheet, et cetera. And so I think I lost count at 125 pages on that one. Um, so most of them were the inventory. Not all of that was of, very little of it was actually of genealogical interest. But these give us clues. Um, so this particular case, Green Atkins is the name of the deceased. Um, and when you're looking in the case, you will see a few things. Um, at the bottom left of the document, there is a little handwritten number that says 336-3, and that is a clerk, as they were scanning this, they numbered the pages within the file. Please know, this does not mean that they were in order when whoever it was numbered them. So you may find things out of order, but hopefully everything will be in the folder or in the file that you need. But that can sometimes help because at least it tells you which copy of the document you've, you're looking at. And they do typically film front and back of all pages. So on this, this is um, uh, Judge Earl Bomar, ordinary said district, and by this point in time, it's not a completely handwritten form. They have the, the boilerplate information written in, typed in, and then they're just filling in some blanks, um, which does make it a little more readable. Um, and it's a, a pointing um, uh, let's see. Ah, it's appointing um, Polly Atkins, uh, the administratrix. And you will see on the back, these things were folded and on kind of the spine of one of the folds, they have the, the summary of the case. So that can sometimes help because sometimes the name inside is written badly, but the name on the spine was written by somebody else or written more neatly. And so sometimes you can figure out who the person is. So the administrator or administratrix um, is given, or ex executor, ex executrix, is given letters of administration so that they can legally represent the work of the estate to divide the property. Do check the back of the page. It will generally reference where this information was recorded. Um, so there are loose papers and then there are also um, bound ledger volumes that have a lot of this information recorded in it. Um, note there are 
many options for transcription errors. But this, in this case, it was recorded in book B, page 40. Um, and Polly is the administratrix. Um, there are also assessors who are appointed to do the inventory. This is another one of the sheets. Um, and yeah, and this is the bottom part of that left-hand page. And you see the uh, um, assessors, you see Polly here, her mark, and then you see the, the uh, Mr. Tinsley and Mr. Staggs who are um, helping value the items in the estate. And they had to inventory it. And then that list had to be approved by the court. Um, in this, there is a bill for boarding Polly Atkins. She was the widow. And in the process of settling the estate, somebody had to house, feed, et cetera, the widow. Um, and so uh, William Staggs is doing that. He's one of the um, uh, assessors on the previous thing. And so he may be a relative, he may be a, a brother. Um, this is not my family. I don't know all the details of this. This was just a good example from our Spartanburg records. And then um, once they had the um, listing of all of the items in the estate, they came back to the court to say, hey, we need to have a sale. And so they requested of the judge and the judge said, sure, go have your sale. Um, <laughs> and uh, we have the plan for the division of the estate. Once they have everything, all the debts are settled, all of the everything is there. The left hand is the plan for the, the settlement and the division as to who gets how much of the, the estate, uh, because this is intestate. So he didn't have a will. So they're having to decide everything. And I apologize, I cannot type. Final, it's petition for final settlement. Um, and uh, this is the, okay, we've decided how it's going to be divided. This is how it's going to be divided once the judge says, go for it. Um, and get, get familiar with handwritten documents as anything in genealogy. Um, it can be an adventure. Um, when these cases take more than one year, um, there is a yearly accounting. So the administratrix has to uh, put in, hey, this is how much we spent on this. This is how much we gained from this. We sold this corn, we got $45. Um, that kind of thing. So you can sometimes see how the cash flow is going. You can find out if they're paying for farm managers or things like that. And then the bill of sale is from the auction and it tells who bought what. So you may find your ancestor on a bill of sale purchasing certain property. You will often see family members purchasing the various pieces of property um, because it was not a given that everybody just got stuff. It was often everything got sold and then the money was divided according to the plan. And so they would have to buy those things in the family that were important to them, um, if they could. Sometimes they could, sometimes they couldn't, but it depended on how much the um, money was needed by the family. Um, and then this is that inventory of the personal property. These are a little out of order, but they were filmed out of order too. And then the actual settlement of the estate. So. Um, they were um, paying off debts. They were dividing up the estate. So. And then um, they did get the court permission for the sale and um, they had the sale. Now, one of the things you may find in the probate collection uh, probate folder is somebody who makes a claim against the estate for debts to be settled and it may be rejected. Um, they don't necessarily have to tell you why it's rejected, but they will tell you it's rejected. And it may be timing. They may have gotten the claim in after the 
um, announced time that people had to submit claims. It may have been seen as a false claim that somebody was just being an opportunist, or it could have been any number of, of reasons for why it was rejected, but you will find those documents as well. Okay, this is a, a slightly different period and, and gives you a chance to look at a slightly different part of it. But again, we have the lenders on this page. It's on page 65A in the index to the probate court here. And um, there's a Jacob Simon Lindler that... in here somewhere. Um, anyway, um, and you can see the dates covered from 1877 all the way up to 1922 on this page. They are roughly in um, date order, but always look through all of the listings because sometimes somebody got missed and sometimes it it it's just filed way later than you think it should be. Um, this In this probate case, as I was looking through the case, we have both a handwritten copy of the will on the left and a typed transcript of the will done at a later time. So sometimes you luck out and get somebody else's opinion on what the handwriting is. Um, and he, he died testate, so this is the will, and this tells what he wants to have done with the property. Um, Another thing that was interesting about this particular probate case is you will notice here the pages are all torn at the fold and they were filmed with enough space that you know that there was actually a tear. So you may be able to digitally edit that or print it and fold it to see if there's actually any loss of information at the fold. Um, and this is throughout the entire um, file. So you get what you get. Sometimes they're really dark parts of the images, et cetera. And then sometimes you get the chicken scratch handwriting. Um, now, some of these are really kind of just notes, but they're the notes that got turned into the judge. And quite frankly, I would want it a little bit more legible to me. But I'm sure the judges are used to reading all sorts of handwriting just like pharmacists can figure out doctor's handwriting most of the time. So um, now this is an example from a North Carolina will book um, that I found online. And it's just a, a good example of watch out for transcription errors when something has been typed. Um, this transcription is at least the third generation of the text because you have the original handwritten text, you have the clerk's handwritten copy into the ledger book, and now you have a typed copy. And so you have, and there could have been more than the three, but this, at minimum there are three um, translation, or three, three groups, and um, you have a lot of chances for errors, or somebody misread it, misread the handwriting in the first iteration of the name, and then that name is just off forevermore. So do check if you can get back to the original, to the handwritten, um, you know, compare as many versions as you can if you have the opportunity. Um, you may find really pretty handwritten and you may find TypeScript and um, this right hand one, um, these are not the same will. Um, but the, the right one here, the will of Amy Pittman, I found that on the South Carolina State Archives website. It's one of the digital images they've put up. She is my fourth great grandmother. Um, in some additional research, I believe her husband's name was Hardy. And um, the typed transcription and the original handwritten one, spellings of a number of the names do not agree. It's the exact same document, but spellings were rather interesting. And I've done some additional research um, working on uh, next month's program on plantation and estate records. Um, and I have discovered that women in the South disproportionately inherited the personal property, i.e. the enslaved uh, persons, if the family was slaveholding. The 
male heirs tended to inherit the land, at least the eldest, but sometimes if there were multiple plantations, multiple sons would inherit land. The daughters would inherit or be given as dower um, the in labor of the enslaved people. And so often that is held up in trust and some things like that. But this is why in 1848, Amy Pittman is leaving her personal property, um, which may have come from her family um, along the way. Still working on it. We're getting back into the dim, dark recesses of South Carolina records. Um, and so she is making arrangements for one of her daughters um, who is not married and making sure that there are sons who are going to take care of her and her property. Um, and one of the sons is in Mississippi, and I'm trying to track that down. Um, so you do find wills for women, um, but they tend not to be relating to land. They tend to be relating to personal property, often that's been held in trust for them. Um, and it's tied up in legalese by their fathers, usually. Um, now, I will say, some places make you hunt for things. South Carolina generally um, pulls things together into a probate file, and so you get these various things. Bibb County, Georgia, um, they do index all of this stuff, but you have to go to the minutes and the letters and the minutes and the will book and the letters and the returns and they're all in different record sets. So sometimes you do have to do some digging. Um, and also, um, sometimes things do take time. So between 1929 and 1931 is when this particular uh, probate was um, done. Now I have seen 30 and 40 years on some of them, so you just, it depends. Um, if you are looking for enslaved um, in the South, or if you are looking for women, you are going to want to look at the appraisal. Um, this is uh, the uh, adjust and true appraisement of the goods, chattel rights, and credits of Joseph Boggs, late of Marion, deceased. Um, another third or fourth great grandfather. Um, he died circa. Uh, 1810, but this list is not made until circa 1840, after the death of his wife, Martha. And this was due um, to her life interest in the property. So some of the property may have been already divided to the children. She only has life interest in a third of it, um, but this is when the main accounting was done. And you will notice it is one lot of Negroes, say 14 head for $3,500. One lot of cattle, say 51 head for $230. One lot of horses, say 11 head, $700. And then you get down here and there is one rocking chair for $60. Um, you get a lot of flax for a dollar, a lot of leather for $3. So everything in the estate, all of the property is being listed. Um, now, this one does not list the Negroes by name. I have seen other appraisements that do list um, the enslaved by name, sometimes by uh, values individually, sometimes by groupings. So the cook, the, the field hands are gonna be in different chunks of um, assessment uh, because there were different values assigned. Um, some of this is not easy reading, but it is a fascinating look at how society functioned. Um, but again, this, this is 40 years or 30 years after he died, but it's his estate because she, they couldn't settle up until she died and she lived a nice long life. Um, again, if you're looking for um, the enslaved um, or women, you're going to find some of them mentioned in how you know caring for things um this is a fifth great grandfather who died around 1820 and this one does list all of the enslaved by name 
So um, in here, um, the following Negroes with their increase, um, Twit, uh, Bass, Haas, Humphrey, Anarchy, Suki, etc. So again, sometimes you do get lucky um, and it's they are named. So don't give up, keep looking, you may find the right document. So some things to remember. Um, in South Carolina, the dower right of women stayed active as a law for longer than many other states. Um, the dower right typically meant one third life interest in any property, real or personal, but not the right to then bequeath that property. As I said earlier, the exception to that is if the property is entailed for her and that is all typically personal property, not real estate. If she remarried, she lost the dower rights unless the will specified otherwise. Um, yeah, I have one case in Virginia on the Eastern shore that she remarried at least twice, I think three times, and man, did that cause problems. But it cost court cases in Chancery Court, which is the equity court, which is when there are problems with probate. So, you know, there are records. And then just remember that for a long time, women could not own property outright, but it could be held in trust for their use, benefit, and bequeathing. So just like Amy Pittman was bequeathing the various of the enslaved to the various children, um, she had that right, um, even if she could not always officially manage that property, some male would have to manage it for her. Um, and uh, dower rights in Virginia. And sometimes you get the general, um, to my wife and children. This doesn't help when you're trying to identify the name of the wife and the name of each of the children. So sometimes it's, it's not helpful. Sometimes they're vague in the wills for um, listing people because they're always afraid of that posthumous child popping up and they don't want that child to be uh, left out. Okay, um, some other things to remember, um, enslaved African Americans were considered to be personal property listed on a state accountings prior to emancipation. So there are additional records that may list the enslaved by name, um, if you can find them. And we'll talk about that next month. Uh, check adjacent counties or where children were living in case the person moved shortly before death. Um, I have an ancestor who moved in 1827 from Virginia to Kentucky, died in 1830. He had sold all of his property or given it to children um, before he moved in 1827. So the records were back in Virginia, not in Kentucky. Um, if they didn't have significant real or personal property, then it's less likely that there would be will or probate um, unless there were a lot of debts. And then um, more modern, if a trust has been set up, then there generally will not be probate unless there's a, con some kind of a con contested bit of it. Um, so sometimes now we see things rolling from a parent to child without extra probate set up depending on how it is set up. Um, now, also um, know that if the primary heir was under 21, then the estate would not be settled until that heir turned 21. Um, they would There would be yearly updates, um, you would have expenses and that kind of thing. Um, and you're going to want to check wills and probate for in-laws, step-parents, um, particularly look at stepfathers because that will often clear up who is their child and who is a stepchild. Maternal grandparents often leave things to their daughter's heirs um, and to their grandchildren. Um, siblings, siblings often leave things to their brothers or sisters um, or to nieces and nephews. And especially if the sibling doesn't have um, children, uh, it can be helpful. Um, and again, some people disperse their property before death, so do check for deeds, transferring land, or enslaved people to their heirs. Um, 
and records of the enslaved probably were not indexed in the various court records. I know Spartanburg's, it is not indexed, but they are there. Um, they are in the deeds um, typically, but they can be in any of the court records on the transfer of those um, enslaved people. So do take a look. Um, there are projects going on now that can um, really help get those names out there. So thank you for joining me on this excursion through our estates, probates, et cetera. And I'm going to turn off the recording and then I'll answer the questions.